Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to be talking about some research I and colleagues have been doing over the past couple years. And you know, some of you may know I have research scientists collaborating, but here I'll be talking about how my team as social scientists have been collaborating with computer scientists to design the future. Okay. This chart shows the traditional um, technology R&D cycle, and there's variations of this, of course, but typically you would have computer science research going on. They would produce proof of concept prototypes that may or may not be then picked up by software developers and usability engineers, uh, social scientists, to interact with stakeholders to produce products that then are deployed, and a lot of social technical research then would study the use and non-use of these IT email, et cetera, with the idea that the results of these studies would feed back into computer science research and influence that. Well, I drew a dotted, dotted line there that, in that feedback loop because a lot of times that doesn't happen. What my colleagues in computer science would say, well, that's very interesting and we believe it. It's not that we don't to believe it, but they don't see the relevance of it to what they are doing currently because they said, you know, we did that research 20 some years ago. We're on to other things now. How can that impact what we're thinking about now? So I've had the pleasure of collaborating with computer scientists right as they're developing those proof of concept prototypes. And we call this approach visioning studies where we look at the vision that the computer scientists and ourselves have come up with four new technology and primarily in complex critical domains and, and collaborate with the intended stakeholders to understand the potential of that technology, the potential for use and non-use with the idea of influencing the proof of concept prototype right at the beginning that then can be passed on to software developers and usability engineers, et cetera. So the goals of a visioning study is to validate proposed benefits, to identify unintended consequences as well as unintended benefits, to provide insights regarding technology features, to identify deployment challenges and possible solutions. What would make this technology adopted and used or not? And we consider the perspectives all of these issues from multiple intended stakeholders' perspectives. Um, and we particularly focus on complex and dynamic domains at this point. And I'd be interested in feedback whether you think this would be worthwhile doing in other types of domains. The idea is we want to in influence computer science research early on in the R&D cycle to save money and re resources. Okay. We have two complementary approaches. One is to investigate task performance. How does this technology, how might this technology influence task performance? And the other is to identify implications in the context of the domain. And that's very social aspects of technology adoption and use. We have done, taken this approach in two studies. One, investigating the potential of 3D telepresence technology in emergency medical care. And that's been going on for a number of years. And the other, more recent study that's still ongoing, is looking at future mobile technology 10 plus years out and its application in police work. Okay. Why we chose the emergency medical care domain is that trauma is a serious or serious physical in injury. It's responsible for more productive years lost than disease, cancer, and stroke combined worldwide. Okay. And as paramedics, not physicians or consultants, that provide emergency health care for trauma victims at accident scenes. So it's very much a complex, dynamic health care situation. And today, predominantly paramedics will consult with physicians or other specialists via radio or phone. 
Okay? There is some use of using state-of-the-art video conferencing technology, state-of-the-art video conferencing technology, but various problems have been identified with this, including difficulty in obtaining the desired camera views, as well as a lack of depth per perception that is very much needed in a lot of medical care situations. So the vision for 3D telepresent technology is illustrated here, or one of the visions certainly, where at a remote accident scene, you would have a, a setup that would contain multiple cameras that would collect multiple views of a situation and then algorithms to merge those views together to in real time present a 3D visualization of the remote accident scene that experts at a large medical center or some other medical center could then view and walk around in and explore in depth. There would be head-mounted tracking devices or other types of physical devices that would change the view the remote uh, physicians or medical experts saw based on their body posture, where they were looking at. Okay. So to, and one of the questions that the funding agency, the National Library of Medicine in the U.S. had is, well, if we spend the millions and millions of dollars that this is going to cost to implement, to do the research and implement, will it make a difference? What will happen? So we looked at task performance and we did an experimental lab-based study that was a post-test between subjects design in which we simulated an emergency medical task situation. We used a medi-human patient simulator, which some of you may be aware of. It's a fully computerized mannequin. Its chest rises and falls when it breathes. Pupils dilate in response to medications. You can do surgery on the mannequin as well. And the task was to diagnose a difficult airway and perform a cricothrotomy, which is a uh, surgical procedure. We had three conditions that we were looking at task performance in. One was a paramedic working alone. Uh, second was a paramedic working in consultation with an expert, an emergency room physician, or accident and emergency, I believe is the phrase here in the UK <laughs> that's used, uh, consultant, uh, using state-of-the-art 2D video conferencing, a dedicated line. And the third condition was the paramedic collaborating with the physician using a 3D proxy or surrogate. Because remember, the technology doesn't exist yet. At this point in time when we were doing this, there was a demo that ran for about two minutes that worked most days, but not all days, uh, with respect to that. Now, I won't go into um, the details about all the measures uh, that we took during the experiment because we would be here for another hour if I did. So I'll just highlight some of the results to give you, to provide examples of the type of information you can get from this type of study. Well, we wanted to look at task performance and its impact on healthcare outcomes. We found that there were fewer harmful interventions occurred, but overall, the medical task completion was not significantly better across the conditions, okay? So the question was, well, what should we even do this for this domain? Because if it's not gonna improve medical outcomes, what's the point? What we found though, was that it also, pre there was a significant positive effect on future task performance as measured by self-efficacy. Okay, so where it might not improve any one particular task performance, it would improve it, the task performance done by paramedics over time. We also found an elimination of negative impact from a lack of prior work experience. And this is important because when you call up, you can't say, send me the paramedic with the most years of experience, please. You get who you get, right? So the technology has a way of flattening that out, providing a high standard of care for everyone, irrespective of how many years of experience the paramedic has. The most surprising result was that there was a significant negative impact on future task performance when collaborating via state-of-the-art 2D video conferencing. We had not predicted this whatsoever, and it made the funding agency pause and say, ah, 
we need to investigate and figure out whether we should be putting video conferencing in the back of ambulance, for example. There's a number of technology recommendations that came out. The necessity to dynamically change remote views was clear. The data was uncontroversial on that. There was a strong need for virtual remote pointer in the, the context, and the utility in showing the remote physician to the paramedic was born through. And the latter two were things that the computer scientists had not considered before this work. Now, so looking at task performance is one type of visioning study. The second type that we've done is investigating implications within the domain. And the question we were asking is what might facilitate and or impede the adoption of use of this technology for emergency medical care, particularly in the US health system. Okay. For this, we did a solely qualitative research study. The first part of the interviews that we conducted with study participants was a five-minute video that we had developed in collaboration with the computer scientists showing a vision for the technology in emergency healthcare situations and presenting it in as neutral way as possible, not saying this should be, but this is how it might be. What do you think about this? After showing the video, we asked a number of open-ended questions, looking at, you know, I'm sure many of you recognize these factors as what prior research has shown to influence adoption of use. People's perceptions of the relative advantage of the technology, complexity, compatibility, trialability, observability, and social influence. We interviewed healthcare practitioners and administrators in different So we got uh, emergency or A&E nurses, uh, resident physicians, as well as their managers. We also interviewed emergency services personnel, paramedics, their managers, and people who train paramedics, um, IT operations personnel, and government medical agencies, those who set standards and reimbursement amounts for hospitals. Uh, we tried to get insurance companies, and they, we couldn't convince them to participate in the interview. That would have been another uh, great area. And the healthcare practitioners were both in large and small medical centers. Here are some examples of the results from the study. There were, people clearly thought that the technology could make medical care visible in new ways across organizations that we had anticipated, across work roles, and across time. Okay? And that they felt it could inspire new modes of working and new treatments, new way of treating patients. Administrators also saw its potential as a marketing tool to attract the right customers to the right patients to their medical centers and hospitals. But a number of challenges emerged that this technology would challenge current practice, and some of these are quite significant challenges. Challenges performance review and reputation, okay? Because if you make an error, it's caught forever. And there's legal implications with that as well. Okay. Medical responsibility and division of labor, it challenges that. It challenges the definition of electronic medical records and bill reimbursement of medical costs. Okay. So there were a lot more findings, and I could go into more detail there, but I just want to mention the second study that's ongoing right now, where we're looking at the future of mobile technology and policing. And what motivated this study, um, in Ireland, the last big IT deployment that they did, the police force spent as many staff months deploying it and training the police as they did in developing the technology. Okay. Really expensive. And there was, you know, the union threatened all sorts of labor actions and slowdowns and work to rules as a result of the technology being introduced, even though the police force has spent quite a significant amount of resources in introducing the technology. 
Another motivation is that we see rapid mobile technology adoption by criminals and the public. And the police forces are you know, behind that adoption curve significantly, um, which has impact for, our, for policing um, in our lives. So this is a dynamic work context impacting lies, lives. We looked at the literature and talked to researchers doing mobile technology research to come up with a vision for mobile technology 10 years out. And here are a list of features um, that we see uh, coming down the road. Smart situation awareness, seamless access to distributed information, proactive dissemination of aggregated information, smart capture of information, real-time analysis and synthesis of information. And we took these features and worked with police officers to develop scenarios where these features would be incorporated seamlessly into various policing situations. And then showed that video and uh, to study participants. We have interviewed 25 study participants in three different countries. And we've done the first pass analysis, but stay tuned, more is coming. Okay? And this was funded by Motorola Research, Motorola Foundation, excuse me. Okay. So just to recap, the idea is to do a visioning study as soon as possible in the computer science R&D cycle, collaborating with computer scientists and intended stakeholders to understand the potential of technology our focus has been on technology that requires a significant infrastructure and is intended for very complex doma uh, dynamic domains and critical domains as well. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. We've got some time for questions. Yes, Karina. And, and of course you're getting in there because actually we've got to be able to be part of the, the development of that vision rather than recalibrating it as they try. But I, I'm just wondering, but I, I'm not really sure I suppose how those visions work within the community of engineering and computer science to actually mobilise and, and get that activity off the ground and what it is we might be doing when we're, we're entering into that. Um, because so often they, the, the rhetoric we get is, we, this is innovation. Yeah? We don't want to know how to embed this into a setting because we, we want to be unconstrained in that, in that, in that space. I just wondered if you encountered that or had anything to say. So one of the motivations for computer scientists to embrace this approach has come from funding agencies who say, you know, we have a limited budget. We can't just keep on funding research where we have no clue it will make an impact. Um, so I got involved in this project basically because the funding agency told the computer science researchers, we want you to evaluate the potential. We want you, how can you prove to us that this is going to make a difference? And they had no clue how to do that. Of course not. That's not their area. Uh, so I had worked with uh, other computer scientists in the same school, and they pulled me, asked me to join the project with that. So that, um, and you know, the influence of funding agencies is uh, not to be underestimated. Um, with respect to the second project, the. Um, it's funded by Motorola Foundation, clearly has links to the Motorola Corporation. And so they see this as, again, hmm, well, can this help inform our research uh, when we're doing it? Because we see this area as a big market. You know, think of all the 
the police officers around the world globally? And could this help them um, in, enhance the reputation in that market, enhance their market share eventually? You know, and they see this as a small investment compared to the amount they invest in computer science, those building that mobile technology. Um, it's a minimal investment, minimal risk for them. Uh, so um, is a challenge. Uh, once I have found that once I work with computer scientists, you know, we have um, we develop strong friendships, and then when I go back and visit them, they always take me around the lab and let me ask my questions. Well, what about this? Have you thought about, you know, this? You know, social science research says, you know, that this won't work for the, such and such a reasons. And the, the response I get, there's two. They're like, oh, well, that, well, that's really interesting. And the other response is, oh, yes, but I've already thought about that. You know, oh, yes, I'm going to build that in. And whether, you know, <laughs> I already had that idea. Uh, whether or not they did, did I don't know. Um, but you know, there's no hard evidence a lot of times that they did. And part of, so part of it is being willing to give up your ideas to others and letting them take ownership of, of your results, of ideas that you have. Um, that's part of it. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so criminals keep track of where police officers are using mobile technology. Much more so police officers keeping track of where criminals are even after a break-in or other accident has, has occurred. So that's, uh, that's one example uh, that they police officers have. Um, uh, they contact each other very quickly using mobile technology. Uh, they share pictures and video with each other via mobile technology. The police force, at least in Ireland, doesn't do that. Yeah, and they're not concerned so much about you know the privacy and security issues that the police are concerned. <laughs> you know. So what? Somebody else picks this up. You know. Just throw away that mobile phone and keep going. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was wondering how you would contextualize your research in terms of the overall um, area of research foresight for future. Would you see yourself as being, as this sort of research being an example of foresight research, or is this something substantially different? I would say it's an example. Thank you again, Diane. Thank you. Thank you.